I make it just a few minutes after the hour, everyone, so I think we'll go ahead and get started at this point. So hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Beth Baker, I'm Senior Media Relations Manager at PLOS, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. We're lucky to be joined by Renee Hoke from PLOS, Fiona Fox from the UK Science Media Centre, and Ivan Aransky from Retraction Watch. We're here to explore the theme of this year's Peer Review Week, which is Research Integrity, Creating and Supporting Trust in Research. Today, we're gonna to talk about how scientific journalism, journal research integrity, and the mechanisms of scientific self-correction intersect and how those relationships impact on the public's understanding of, and of course, trust in science. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the format of the hour today. We've got a full hour and we'll be starting with brief intros from each of our panellists. They'll be telling us about themselves, their role and their organisation and how that fits into the broader picture of scientific integrity. Then I'm going to be asking some questions to guide our discussion. I know many of you sent us questions in advance of the session. Thank you so much for that. And we've used those to create some questions, which I think will speak to some of the big themes in this topic. We're going to allow about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for audience questions. So there'll, there'll be some um, questions asked already, but if you've got questions yourself, we'll be using Slido to collect those today. Hopefully you can see on your screens uh, a link to the Slido uh, page and also you can see it in the chat. So please join that now. Not only can you ask questions, but you can also upvote questions that look particularly interesting to you so that we make sure we get to the most important ones. And we'll make sure we finish within an hour today so you can get on with your days. I hope that's all clear. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'd love each of you panelists to introduce yourselves, take just a couple of minutes, tell us who you are, what you do, how that fits into research integrity. And in case we don't know already, why don't you tell us a bit about your organizations as well? And uh, let's start with Renee, shall we? Great, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Renee Hoke, and I work for PLOS, which is an open access publisher uh, with uh, main groups in San Francisco area and the UK, although we're now globally distributed, uh, thanks to the last couple of years. Um, and I'm the managing editor for the publication ethics team at PLOS. Um, I have a background in science, so I have a PhD in molecular and cellular biology and did a number of years of research before I transitioned into publishing. Um, and at PLOS, uh, I've been leading this publication ethics team for a few years now. And at a higher level, my role and the role of my team is to ensure the integrity and reliability of PLOS content, working closely with all of our journal teams. And so we respond to concerns raised about content. Uh, we ensure that our policies remain current and effective with regards to publication ethics issues. We inform relevant teams across PLOS of emerging ethics and integrity issues and threats, um, develop preventive approaches to address these threats at a system-wide level. And we also are involved in cross-industry initiatives to address um, integrity and publication ethics issues. For example, looking at where new guidance is needed across the industry um, or where standards are shifting um, and there are new issues that we need to discuss across publishers. Um, sounds, like, I will stop. sounds like you're kept pretty busy, Renee. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Fiona, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so thanks, uh, Beth and PLOS, for inviting me to take part in this. I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So uh, I'm Fiona Fox. I'm the founding director of um, the Science Media Centre, which is an independent press office for science, which was set up in 2002 in the UK. Um, we now have several SMCs around the world, but in our case, it was set up after media frenzies over MMR, GM crops, animal rights extremism etc um, our objective is to improve the quality of the science reported in the news media in order to improve public understanding and trust in science so we have a big focus on standards so very relevant i think for today's discussion um, and standards across the board so we're interested in, in in driving up standards in science media relations so science press officers and universities and research institutes in science journalism in the news in particular but also in among scientists that scientists are kind of um communicating science in the most accurate and measured way and by standards that's really what we're talking about accurate measures measured communication that avoids hype and avoids exaggeration etc 
Um, and we believe that high standards um, in science communication will deliver public trust. Everything we do, I won't go through it now, but if you look at our website, you'll see everything we do for the news media is with this aim in mind. And I think in particular, the things to highlight are third party comments on new findings in journals. So we seek scientists who will give us third party comments um, and we ask them to emphasize the caveats, um, any limitations of the study so that journalists are very aware um, of that. And also we run briefings on significant new findings in order to allow all of the science and health and environment journalists in the UK to come along and meet the scientists, interrogate them, ask them questions and better understand the findings. So that's us in a nutshell. Great. Yes, I know you and the UK Science Media Centre are right in the centre of that web of science communicators. It's great to hear all that about what you do. Lovely. And Ivan, tell us about what you do. Sure. Um, no, thanks very much uh, for to PLOS for having me and for the opportunity to have this, uh, what I'm sure will be a very compelling and provocative discussion. Um, so I'm Ivan Ransky. I will sort of tell you about the various hats I wear because I think they're all relevant in one way or another to this discussion, uh, particularly in terms of the journalism aspect of it. Um, I am the editor-in-chief of Spectrum, which is an editorially independent uh, publication about autism research for autism researchers, although anyone can read us uh, here at the Simons Foundation, which funds a lot of uh, basic science in autism, uh, but we are editorial independent of, of that. Um, and I've been here about two years and I've been, uh, health and medical and science journalist for a bit over 20 years now uh, at very, with various roles. And so I think I just wanted to, although I don't think that's really the core reason I was in, asked to sort of join this panel, um, I did want to mention that both in terms of conflict of interest and also because I've obviously held a lot of roles at places like uh, Medscape and Reuters and Scientific American, uh, The Scientist and elsewhere uh, over my uh, career in journalism. I also teach medical journalism at uh, New York University uh, at the Science Health Environmental Reporting Program. Uh, I've taught medical journalism there uh, for 20 years, uh, back to 2002. Um, uh, my title is Distinguished Writer in Residence, which basically means that I teach a few courses a year and get involved in some other uh, initiatives there, but um, again, have taught medical journalism for about 20 years. Um, the, the Probably the main reason I was asked to, to be here, and, and obviously it says here that I'm uh, at Retraction Watch, is that uh, about 12 years ago now, uh, Adam Marcus and I co-founded Retraction Watch. Uh, Retraction Watch started out as a blog, which was looking very uh, specifically at the, if you will, correction me mechanism in science, self-correction, uh, and obviously the retraction sort of mechanism in science. Um, we didn't know a lot of what we know now, um, and it, who knows if we would have even you know, been prompted to start and launch Retraction Watch given that, because it turns out there's a, there are a lot more attractions than we thought, and they're growing very quickly. And I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. But our goal is to look at that, um, that mechanism, look at retractions as a window into, into the scientific process, particularly into the scientific correction process. Um, so in addition to more or less daily posts on the blog, where we look at various cases, and we look at um, sometimes, hopefully, the stories behind those retractions, which we find always very interesting. Um, we also have a database of retractions, which has uh, not quite 36,000 retractions in, in it now, by far the most comprehensive database of retractions. And our hope there is to increase trust, frankly, in scientific publishing and in scientific publication by allowing people to check for references that are retracted to make sure that they're not you know, pursuing work that in fact is no longer reliable. Um, and we are, the, the data are integrated into a number of um, software platforms, uh, particularly Zotero and EndNote, uh, among others. Um, and they, the idea is to actually sort of clean out the stables, if you will, which I know that uh, uh, others on the panel are also interested in and, and doing important work in, in various ways. So that's, uh, that's who we are. Great. 36,000 retractions. That sounds like quite a read, Ivan. I'm sure all our audience will be rushing off to look into that after this. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, now we all know each other. So fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, and so we're going to launch into some questions. Um, so first question for you. What role can journals play to support trust in science and how should they communicate about what they do? And I'm guessing, Renee, you might be the obvious person to start with this one. <laughs> 
Great, sure. Um, yeah, I think that first and foremost, journals support trust in science by providing the peer review and publication system itself, a system in which readers can identify work that's been evaluated by experts and deemed by their peers to be valid. And then we can build upon this by making those contents and the data, our policies and information about the peer review process itself openly available and upholding high standards of research reporting. And with these, with this openness and transparency, we can we provide readers the tools that they need to evaluate or replicate the work. But as we know, trust in science can be challenged or shaken when questions arise as to whether published work is valid or if the integrity is called into question. And so it's important that we also have systems and policies in place to address these issues. Um, and so that's where my team comes into play at FLOSS um, because we need to really demonstrate through action that we're committed to integrity and that we're working to ensure that our content can be trusted. <laughs> So in terms of communicating these efforts, a lot of the information is on our journal websites itself in terms of policies, standards, and peer review models. Um, but the general public may not be combing through those pages or may not even care to know what that information is or know where to look. And so that's where the journalism piece can come into play and be really um, an important support by helping people understand key information about the science communication system um, and communicating not only the research findings, but also relevant information about the standards, processes, and various initiatives that we have in place to help to support and build upon that trust and ensure that um, the work that we put out there is reliable. Mm. So communicating not just the science, but also the process of science and, and communicating that. Interesting. Um, Ivan or Fiona, would either of you like to speak um, to your thoughts on the role of journals in this? Um, I can just say, I mean, more or less, I, I you know agree with what I just heard from Renee. And um, I guess from our perspective, again, as outsiders, not as uh, journal editors, of course, or publishers, um, I would just underscore the importance not only of explaining what the process is, and but having a process. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, one of the uh, and at the risk of sounding as though I'm pandering to our hosts here, um, PLOS is actually uh, one of the few, I would say, journals that has a team like Renee's. Um, the, the, the number of journals that has a team like Renee's are, are growing, um, and there are some actually that have had them you know, long before PLOS, uh, and some publishers have sort of somewhat um, you know, robust processes and um, teams that actually look into allegations or look into papers before they're even published, you know, when they're in the manuscript phase, but even having that will to do that, um, you know, you would think that would be just considered de rigueur in terms of scientific publishing, but actually it's a pretty recent phenomenon. And I think that it often is in response to uh, people finding out that there are lots of issues in literature and the, the, the place that we see that trust erodes is when people sort of bring allegations or they they hear about allegations and they don't see anything happening. Um, and I don't mean that has something has to happen that minute, but you know, just this morning, um, we put up a post uh, for about a journal that was not a PLOS journal actually, although, you know, we've obviously written about PLOS quite often, um, but where basically there was an allegation of plagiarism a year ago, um, the editor acknowledged it, but they did nothing for a year. The 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 upshot is that the uh, person who was plagiarized, whose work was plagiarized, was so fed up by this, this lack of action, uh, that he started tweeting about it. We saw that, uh, and then we called the journal, and lo and behold, you know, the combination of, I guess, the tweeting and somebody calling from Retraction Watch, all of a sudden there's an editor's note on this uh, article. Um, I can't mm -hmm. say cause effect there, but I can tell you what happened in sequence. So if you don't look as though you have a process for uh, dealing with errors and and corrections and and retractions, that's where trust erodes. And and I would I would just second what Renee is saying. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like being able to demonstrate responsiveness and accountability are really important then to to foster that trust in the scientific process as well as the science itself. Great. So I think um, I come I come at this from a slightly different angle, don't I? Because because obviously I what I think. Um, 
the role of journals is is very much in in the press team. Um, uh, the the I don't know if people realise, but how much of the kind of daily diet of science stories in in the news media come from journals? I've never I don't know Ivan if you've ever done this, but I mean I would I would say it's sixty seventy percent. I mean if you speak to the science. Um, and health journalists, they expect their Tuesday to be, you know, their Nature Day, their Wednesday to be their BMJ and Lancet Day. A large number of the stories they do every week come directly from the journals, and that comes via a press office. Um, the press offices identify which stories to press release, uh, they contact the journalists. So I think this is a really important role for journals. And um, I, I'm also pretty positive about this, actually. I think a lot of the um, uh, press offices, including Beth, that's how we met you, Beth, uh, uh, for the journals are extremely responsible, um, see their role as good, uh, measured, accurate communication, often amazingly in some ways flag up papers to the Science Media Centre to get third party comments because they're worried they will be um, exaggerated or hyped by journalists. So um, mostly I think this is working, but I do think the press offices are probably not seen very often and they're a, uh, an absolutely critical part of, mm -hmm. of um, good communication. One other thing that I would say is publicizing negative results. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still think there's a bit of a trend where, where we sometimes find out about papers with negative results that to us are really important, but they haven't been highlighted for a press release that week by the journal, I think that would increase trust. Yeah, um, you've really nicely anticipated my next question, Fiona, so thank you so much. It gives us a good segue. Um, just quickly, before we do get into that, I want to remind anyone who's joined us a little bit late, we are using Slido to take your questions today. So if you do have questions as we're talking about these themes, do add them to the Slido. You can also upvote questions there, and we'll get to those in the last 15 minutes of, of our chat today. So the question that Fiona has beautifully led me into there, how can journalists, press officers and other intermediaries help the public to understand research findings? Fiona, I know you've spoken a little bit to this. If there's anything you'd like to say about intermediaries beyond press officers, I mean, of course, you are part of this, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, I mentioned this in my introduction, I, I think that almost everything we do is to help journalists to report science more accurately so that's not that it's not that we're better than other press officers it's just that other press officers do PR for their university researchers and they want to get the amazing stories of their scientists out into the world and that's brilliant um, we are not doing that we don't do press releases we don't have scientists what we have is 3,000 scientists on the database who we've recruited to this goal about accuracy and we wouldn't work if if the news journalists who cover science health and environment didn't work with us they do work with us and, and what we what they do is look at the third party comments if five of them are saying this is a rubbish study it shouldn't be reported um you know it, it's a tiny study that's only done in mice doesn't support the claims being made in the press release um then quite often they will go and fight with their editors and say we shouldn't be reporting this equally if seven or eight um, of these third party scientists say this is the holy grail yesterday I ran a press briefing on a, a new drug for motor neuron disease it only helps two percent um, of patients with motor neuron disease with a particular gene sod one um, but actually all of the third party comments were saying this is very significant there have been 25 trials of drugs that don't work this is a kind of uh, game changer in terms of an approach but really emphasizing the caveats and the limitations um, and, and the journalists really absorbed that and reported mm -hmm. accurately so you, what you need here is people who think this is important who think it is their responsibility to report new findings in a measured way which doesn't either over exaggerate or underplay I mean sometimes we'll get eight or nine comments saying this is the holy grail this is the step change that we've been trying to do for years you know put this on the front page and then the public will um, learn that this is significant other times the journalists will still run it but they will emphasize the caveats and of course let's not be uh let's not say there's no problem sometimes we will have eight scientists from different universities who don't speak to each other saying this is absolute crap shouldn't have been published by this journal shouldn't be and we wake up the next day to coffee causes cancer says new findings so it, you know you you win some you lose some um but overall i think it's pretty it's pretty surprising how many we win <laughs> 
Yeah, and I think there's a really interesting analogy here with um, the pre-publication peer review. In a sense, what you're working with with these experts is almost like a peri-publication or a post-publication peer review where you're having the opportunity for these experts, um, who are some of those intermediaries that we're talking about in a sense, to give you their take, which is so important on, on the scientific um, results that you're, you're seeing. Great. Um, Ivan, Renee, would you like to speak to the role of um, other other people beyond the journals, so journalists, press officers, other intermediaries? Uh, you've talked about your role, of course, Ivan, in this. Yeah, well, I, I would say, I mean, I, and I would sort of describe a little bit of how I uh, work with my students uh, at, at NYU to, to think through these issues. And I think the, the most important thing, which uh, Fiona's touched on, is sort of context writ large. And so um, where are these findings? How do they fit in? Um, what have other studies said before this? Uh, what what do we know and what we what do we not know? Um, and I really uh, try and encourage them not to think about uh, sort of what are really false binaries. I mean, this works, this doesn't work. This this causes cancer. This you know cures cancer. Um, there, there's that hilarious. I don't know if it's updated anymore, but you know the the um, uh, what what's the the name of the website that that sort of looks at uh, the Daily Mail and and everything that create you know causes or prevents cancer everything is apparently in one category or the other they don't know what to do with alcohol it apparently does both so who knows um you know mm -hmm. what, what what's going to happen there uh, this will sound but, very familiar to fiona too i'm sure yeah no, I'm, I'm sure brilliant it's a brilliant send up um i think though i i guess and and fiona i i actually again i haven't done any surveys or anything but certainly your your numbers sound more or less correct to me um uh, broadly speaking 60 or 70 percent of, of sort of science news and science medical news and environmental news coming from uh, journals. I, I And if I may, and I don't, I, I, and, and I'm gonna say how I actually think journals can play an even more important role here, but at the outset, I actually think that maybe fewer studies should, fewer stories should originate as journal uh, studies. And and that doesn't that actually, and again, I'll come back to why that actually means they should, they're more important. What I'm really talking about is single study stories. And people have written about this sort of notion of, single study syndrome. I mean, the, the sort of um, killer cure, that's the name of the site, sorry, I forgot it. Um, killer cure, cure is, what, is sort of an extreme example of that. It maybe makes people think about it the most, but it's really true on, on you know, every study, you know, every story you read that's about a single study. Now you can do that with a lot of context and a lot of nuance and, and a lot of journalists do, but often you don't. And even if you're doing it that way, uh, you are overemphasizing, you know, sort of single sort of points in time, uh, single studies, which all have limitations, uh, particularly those in humans. Um, it's not a criticism; it's just a it's just a fact. Um, you have to be honest about those. So, I would love to see, and I think you're starting to see a lot some of this um, stories that are not again based on what came out today or came out last week, but okay, what is really going on in a given field now? But there, where the journals are even more important is relying on the journal evidence in toto, right? And referring to specific studies and linking to them, you know, they don't have to be meta-analyses, systematic reviews, in other words, studies of studies, mm -hmm. although that's obviously, that can be helpful. But I think that the, the overarching idea is um, context and often context means eschewing the, uh, the single study story uh, when possible. Mm -hmm. So journalists have a real role in discernment, I guess you might say. Obviously, press officers, you know, they often have incentives to be publicising more stories. Um, it's interesting. I mean, this is just my experience as a press officer, but it seems to me like sometimes when we do promote um, or describe meta-analyses and systematic reviews, they actually get a little bit less attention than you'd hope. Um, perhaps journalists will correct me, I'm sure, but perhaps they're not seen as new news in the same way as, as the single, st um, single study stories are. But that's that's a really interesting perspective. And I, I definitely agree seeing more stories about the scientific consensus um, would be really interesting. I think this feeds in a little bit to what I was going to ask next. Um, I think you may have even answered this for me, Ivan, from your perspective. When we're communicating around complex, nuanced and even sometimes conflicting scientific findings, how do we avoid public confusion and misunderstanding? The Kill or Cure website is such a good example um, that, as you say, parodies that, that, that phenomenon, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, a couple things about sort of public understanding and misunderstanding. Um, I, I think, and, and these are probably going to all contradict each other, which maybe is a bit of a meta point uh, that I'm trying to make unintentionally or unconsciously. I mean, first of all, I, I think we actually often uh, 
give the public less, much less uh, credit than they deserve. Um, uh, and in fact, and, and that works the other way too, which is where we sort of assume, make assumptions about how they will read something. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, don't give them credit for being able to discern, um, frankly, what our biases are, you know, what the biases of a particular news organization might be, um, or a particular outlet, whether it's a news organization or not. So I, I think that's, that's one. Um, at the same time, I think we do have to be very conscious of the sort of um, uh, real uh, of, of not playing into the misinformation by telling full stories and not providing sort of I, ammunition is a terrible word to use, but sort of ammunition for people who uh, will do whatever they're going to do with those in, items anyway. I, I, you know, back in we, when uh, when Adam and I launched Retraction Watch, uh, so about a dozen years ago. Um, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, it was a bucolic time and, you know, it was, you know, no one was, but, you know, there, there were a lot, we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, there were a lot of, you know, social media was not as nearly as big a thing, and so you didn't have that sort of amplification of, of often misinformation. Um, but one of the big issues that we dealt with, if you will, is that the um, people who uh, do not believe in, in, in um, evolution, uh, whether they're are creationists, or they call themselves intelligent design advocates, et cetera, they would sort of, they loved Retraction Watch from almost from mm -hmm. day one. They would say, oh, look at this, you know, these two guys, you know, these sort of like apparently well-educated and appropriately credentialed guys, you know, they're saying there's tons of problems with peer review. And, and we actually are, to be totally clear, and we can happy to discuss that. But okay, uh, we still think peer review is really important. We just think there's flaws in it. And they'd say, see, well, since peer review is you know, obviously deeply flawed. Look at these guys with protection watch. You might as well believe this creation myth. I mean, it, it was, I'm, I'm not really overstating that sort of how that argument went. It's obviously a ridiculous argument. I won't get into that. Um, I trust our audience to be able to see right through it. But my point is that we, it, we actually started thinking that through. And when we would write about particular issues, we would actually put in little poison pills, if you will, little sort of clauses that would say, you know, this doesn't mean X, because we could actually start to anticipate what sorts of things might people might misuse it for. Now, I think we've sort of seen all of that just go completely, you know, bonkers in terms of uh, the pandemic in particular, obviously. And that has to do with partisanship and all sorts of things that have fed into this really ugly scene that we've seen. Um, but I do think that, you know, journalists can, again, both, create, you know, trust their audience more, but also anticipate how something might be used, whether you want to call it misused or not, um, and think through that. You shouldn't self-censor, though. And I think that that's, uh, that also has become a, a real problem. And I think that something that people need to, to really consider. Um, you need to go out there with you know, what the evidence is, not what the evidence that you, you wish it was. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. And I mean, to look back a step um, as well with press officers, I mean, when, whenever we're writing about a particularly controversial topic, one thing I always emphasize is that we should not only talk about what the research shows, but also what it doesn't show. So it's really interesting to have that perspective. Um, Fiona, I know you've dealt with so many of these really nuanced issues and communicating, working with journalists on them. What would you like to say about this? Yeah, I just, I, I was just nodding um, at everything Ivan said. I, I totally just, I totally agree. Um, especially with not underestimating the public audience. And I think this, the pandemic, there's lots of examples here from the pandemic, aren't there? The, the, one of the ones that struck me was, and, and sorry, this is quite a UK um, story, but, but the JCBI, which are the um, advisory group on vaccines, um, I knew that they were talking about not um, advocating vaccines for children um, because of the individual risk profile, because children don't get it as badly and whatever. Um, I knew that that was happening. Um, and I remember talking to a journalist and saying, what, do, what would happen? I also knew that the um, chief medical officers in the government were unlikely to accept that. So I asked a journalist, what do you think would happen if the JCBI recommended not to vaccinate children and the government decided to vaccinate? And the journalist said, it couldn't happen. It can't happen. It won't happen because that will be too, some way it it won't be allowed to happen because that will be too confusing and the government and everyone needs a single public health message. Two days later, that is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran a briefing with our friends on JCVI. They explained so clearly 
Why? Because their remit is to look at the individual risk benefit that they were not, um, they were kind of on the fence, but they were not strongly recommending vaccinating children. They handed that final decision to the four chief medical officers of the four parts of the UK. And those four CMOs a couple of days later came out and said, we, we want to vaccinate children. The sky didn't fall in. Uh, yes, there was confusion, but there were. I listened to um, you know Vox Pops on BBC, and you'd see these ordinary working class people stopped on the street and repeating back some of the. Oh well, I've listened to this, and it seems that the vaccine advisors uh, don't want it for this reason. But if you take in all of it and schools closing and all the social impacts, the chief medical officers have come to a different conclusion beautifully understood mm. Mm. um so i am just such a a fan of open communication of uncertainties totally agree as well with ivan about the real dangers the hostage to fortune of 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 kind of um pretending that there's no uncertainty and we saw this with climate skeptics where the skeptics absolutely abused the fact and i was i had lots of very good friends in science who were saying fiona we we must stop emphasizing the uncertainties around climate change we have to say it is happening you know even even to say the debate is over climate change is happening there is no debate as if mm -hmm. there would never be any science that would ways and i think that was a gift to the mm -hmm. skeptics and I think you have that with the lab leak where, you know, that certainty at the beginning with scientists saying there was no lab leak. We've got to get the message out that this is 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 from um, the markets and from animals. It was too early. You know, mm. it was too uncertain to say that. And guess what? The the kind of anti-science brigade um, really abused that. So. So, mm. yeah, I think open communication of uncertainty every time. I love these examples. I mean, particularly that first one with the, the vaccines. I love the demonstration of how actually knowledge really is power and adding more information and more context was so important in understanding a situation that might perhaps have appeared uh, contradictory if you didn't have that. So that sounds like a really valuable lesson. Great. Um, well, this is a somewhat related question, but I think this really speaks more to um, perhaps Renee's role. When we're investigating scientific misconduct, how should we communicate around what we're doing and what we find? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question. And I just want to start out by taking a little bit of the language and shifting it, um, because when we are looking at these cases, not all of them are due to scientific misconduct, and that doesn't make them any more or less important to investigate. And importantly, the journals don't have responsibility for determining whether misconduct has even occurred. So why don't you give um, us, Renee, a, a rough and ready definition of how you would see misconduct? Because it's a tricky term, isn't it? Well, I think, I mean, institutions like in at least in the US have, have strict definitions around falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism. But a lot of the concerns that are raised to journals about around content, they might have to do with um, other types of issues um, or even cases where there might be an image integrity issue, but it might not have been a deliberate uh, misrepresentation. It may have been due to an error. So just, just sort of reframing this around any concerns that are raised. Um, and there is industry-wide uh, guidance in terms of communicating the outcomes of these cases in terms of having public editorial notices, ideally that are available in uh, openly available in full text format for readers um, so that readers know whether or not to rely upon the work. Um, and there's also industry standard around communicating outcomes to certain stakeholders, like the people who raise the concerns, the people whose work are questioned, maybe the editors who were involved along the way. Um, and so I think in terms of the outcomes, we have some really um, some somewhat consistent uh, ways of communicating those. And in some cases, we might choose to take it a step farther and talk about it in a news story or a blog post um, to give more information to readers. Um, but I think that the, um, the other question is what we're doing now. So cases that haven't yet been resolved, where things have been flagged and either the investigations were pending or they're in process. And I don't think that there's a clear, firm industry standard for that yet at this point. And there are various reasons for different approaches around um, you know, protecting um, 
the published record until you, you know, not wanting to disrupt the published record if you don't have clear evidence to support the changes needed, um, being very careful to provide due process for the sake of the people involved. Um, but yet there's also the, the risk that if problematic content is in the public domain and isn't marked, that that presents a risk for researchers using that content or for the public who might be affected by applications of that. Um, and so this is a really valid concern, particularly given that um, ethics and integrity group have groups typically have limited resources and it takes quite a bit of time to complete these investigations. Mm. And so we can use interim notices like expressions of concern, um, which we would typically use if there's if we perceive a, a serious risk to leaving that article unmarked or if we expect a really long investigation process. Mm. But I expect that we'll be moving more towards shifting this goalpost so that we uh, have more consistent usage of interim notices and so that readers can get that information sooner um, without that subjective judgment call as a gatekeeper um, along the way. That That's really interesting to hear that there are uh, guidelines about um, cases when you might say you've got a, an, a final outcome, but it's a little bit trickier during that process. I guess, Ivan, you're coming into these cases often at all sorts of stages, where before they're investigated, you're flagging them, and also during and after any investigation by the journal. What would you like to say about scientific misconduct and how we communicate it? Yeah, I'm sorry. We only have, uh, you know, under an hour, so I, I will try and be brief. And, and as Renee certainly knows, I, I have a lot to say about it. But I, I, I would, again, echo a lot of what Renee is saying. I, I think I would probably over, or I would further emphasize the sort of the wastefulness and the uh, the wasted time resources um, that happens because these processes take so long. Um, and, and I and again, I understand that they have to take a certain amount of time, but a lot of the cases that we've uh, written about and, and often what we'll do is then mm -hmm. file uh, public records requests uh, to learn what really happened or at least what we can learn and, and the timeline. So when did a university, for example, contact a journal. When did an allegation come in? That sort of thing. Um, and, you know, this is oversimplified, but it just often takes much longer than it seems like it should. Um, things sit on people's desks and what have you. It can take years. And, and the people that I think about when I think about how long this takes are certainly the public, um, because there is something out there that people are relying on, uh, whether it's directly or indirectly. There are guidelines that might be associated with it. Um, I think about the public, certainly when it's a public health kind of uh, issue, um, which is in many ways why it's good that so many papers have been scrutinized and even retracted during the pandemic, because it means that people are paying more attention and actually doing something about it. But I also think about scientists, uh, particularly early career scientists, who basically, you know, it's not unusual. In fact, it's quite common for, you know, a senior person, you know, the PI, a principal investigator in a lab, somebody who runs a lab, say, here, this is a really interesting finding, you know, grad student or postdoc, please go and, um, you know, try and, you know, replicate it, maybe try to tweak it a little bit, what what happens, you know, what might we learn from it, what might we do next, uh, what's the next experiment, set of experiments. Think about being that person and trying for six months or even a year to replicate, in other words, to repeat a set of experiments and it never works. And you're convinced it's you because it was published in some wonderful journal, some high impact factor journal or even not high impact factor journal. You know, what often happens with those people and you don't hear from them a lot because they are the, you know, the lowest rungs on the ladder kinds of folks in science, they get really fed up or they get, they decide it's them and for so, or for some reason, or their, their lab leaders tells them that it's their problem. Um, what's wrong with you? This was in nature. Um, and they leave science. Uh, and never mind the wasted time they've actually spent during while they're there. They leave science. And those are some of the people who are probably, frankly, the best suited to think about how these issues work, you know, and how we can improve things. So I just, I, I think about all those people when I think in particular about how long all these things take. The other thing I'll say mm -hmm. briefly is, um, one of the reasons we launched Retraction Watch was because the retraction notices, in other words, the little, the, the accompanying text to the fact that something been retracted often was either incoherent or, or didn't include any information or was even misleading or wrong. 
I will say, and, 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 you know, data are, you know, we're actually going to try and look at this in a more systematic way. Um, certainly at a lot of journals that's improved, um, whether it's because they're tired of us pointing it out or others pointing it out or just for whatever reason. And I will say that a lot of journals have improved in that regard. And I think that's really important because it is important to know. And, and I probably would not so much differ with Renee, but sort of have some nuance around who's responsible for what sorts of, uh, you know, um, sort of um, determinations. But I, I would say that, um, you know, in general, they have gotten better. And that's really important for the scientific record, too. Thanks, Ivan. That perspective of the early career researcher, I think, is so important and will be so easy to overlook. So thanks in particular for that. So um, my final question, and I know we're a little short on time, so I think I'm going to hand this one purely over to Fiona, um, if that's all right with you, Fiona. Um, and it's around uh, the scientific consensus. Sometimes the scientific consensus on an issue changes over time. You will have seen this, I'm sure, many times in your, in your tenure at the Science Media Centre. So in these cases, how do we demonstrate uh, transparency about the scientific process and how that evidence is changing without eroding public trust in science? I guess yeah. there'll be examples from the COVID pandemic as well as well before that. Yeah, I think um, it really links back to that, my previous point, doesn't it, about openness on uncertainty and how that actually improves public trust. But there's definitely two schools of thought on, on this. I think that I think the government in particular believes that one single public health message and you stick to it. And if you admit to uncertainties and differences of opinion, we even had government press officers coming and saying, can't you stop some of these scientists disagreeing in COVID? You know, A, chance would be a fine thing and B, you know, honestly, wrong, wrong, wrong conclusion. We understand because there is evidence, you know, that a single public health message is useful if that's built on a hugely strong consensus built over many years. But if it's not there, it's, a, you know, a, Ivan's earlier point then and you try and create it and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, um, um, go over the, the differences. So, yeah, I mean, a, a maximum openness. I have seen I've seen it on neonics. That was a, an issue that the consensus among the kinds of scientists who are experts on this class of pesticides early on was this was a more effective pesticide and was not linked with um, impacts on bees in particular um, and you know a lot of them were at the center for ecology and hydrology they were really good experts they were generally pointing to the evidence base but you know like a mantra where, where the data changes the the science and, and the advice changes um, and they did a very big uh, multi-country multi-field trial on the impact of uh, these these pesticides on bees and showed a, a, an impact and so mm -hmm. the consensus changed and I think you know ne never mind the public or anyone else I, I don't trust scientists if they always find the same thing no matter how they do the experiment no matter what happens they always find the same thing I find myself being a little bit skeptical about them especially if they're also a scientist who's quite you know active on twitter and very opinionated and they've kind of you know tied their their um opinions to that particular thing and then they're still doing science and it's always backing up that thing i just find myself a bit wary of them mm -hmm. so uh, if that if that is the same for other members of the public i'm pretty convinced that the public trusts scientists because they are different to politicians they're different to campaigners all of whom are good people people but the scientific approach is to is to actually test that view with a well-designed experiment that is then peer-reviewed that is then published um, and that's why they get their trust so so when mm. that evidence changes um, and, the, and the consensus check the other thing I'd say very briefly on the pandemic was there couldn't be a consensus. And one of the things that drove me mad in, in the early months was, do you, do you remember all these joint letters? There was joint letters on, on herd immunity and joint letters on the lab leak. Why are we writing joint letters uh, which indicate a consensus around different approaches on vaccine when we're three months into this with a new virus? There was no, it wasn't like climate change where I think there is a consensus or GM crops where there is a consensus. Those consensus build over many, many years and a huge, huge amount of science and evidence builds up such that you can describe a consensus but but that takes time so the other thing scientists should be very wary of is deciding that that you know the majority opinion says this when it's too early on e-cigs we we don't know we know e-cigs are better than cigarettes but we don't know whether they are absolutely safe and um, there is no scientific consensus that e-cigarettes are, are safe 
Um, and that may well change as we have them for longer and as we do more experiments. But it's the experiments and the science that will lead us. And, and openness mm -hmm. about that is so crucial. Great. Yeah, it sounds like your tips would be, you know, to do the groundwork from the start and don't try and present something as a false consensus. And that way, if the evidence does change, you're a lot more honest and, and able to be transparent about that. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. That's been so interesting. Thanks for your patience with my questions. Um, now we get the exciting bit where we get to hear from our audience. And my lovely colleague, Lindsay, has been keeping an eye on Slido for us. So, Lindsay, what are the most popular questions that we've been getting? <coughs> Hey, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. This has been a really interesting conversation. I'm just going to go ahead and share our Slido screen with you. Now, our first question is, um, do you think preprints undermine uh, trust and research communication? And, you know, of course, the challenge there being that preprints are not yet peer reviewed. Mm. Who'd like to speak to that? I think I could, I'll start out, I'm guessing others will follow, but um, I think that preprints serve a certain role, which is that they allow researchers to communicate their findings quickly um, and get information out to the public. But it's important that they're received for what they are and that they're not misperceived as being published in peer reviewed articles. Um, and so in part that's on the reader to to understand what it means to be a preprint, but it also, if you know, if we're talking about these um, contents, whether in the context of a research article or a journalistic piece, um, really clearly noting that this is unpublished work, or um, I think is it's it's important. Mm. Fiona, I know this has been a perennial topic for you, and you and I have had many discussions on this. What, what are your thoughts? And also, have your thoughts changed during the pandemic when we saw a real explosion of preprints and an, uh, an urgency around science? Yeah, I mean, as Ivan said earlier, um, I could talk um, about this for days. I will try and be brief. I think actually the, the way this question is presented is quite interesting. I think preprints could enhance trust in, in research because this is scientists putting an early version of their findings onto a preprint server for every other scientist in the field to wade in, pull it apart, improve it, you know, point out the, the problems with it. So, so I'm, I'm a massive fan of, of preprints and open peer review and all of that. Um, but I think there is a, a really basic question, which sometimes um, when I say to scientists, they do finally get what I'm saying, there's, there's the purpose of preprint for science, and then there's still a question of when do you put findings into the public domain? And I think we can all agree, can't we, that we would like that to be when those findings are the best they could be. Simple as that. And that's the whole point of preprints and open peer review is to make the science better. So I still, if I have a choice, want those findings to get to the wider public that's different to the science community when they're at their best and that's when they've been peer reviewed when they've been improved when corrections have been made and I think one of the things that people forget is there's another aspect of this which is impact so we would apart from the pandemic where I think it was really different we would like press officers not to publicize them. So they're out there, the scientific community are, 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 are um, scrutinizing them and improving them. But when they are publicized via a press release is when they're ready, when, when they're either accepted for publication or they're, you know, they've been peer reviewed because you're not gonna get two bites at the cherry. Uh, and I think the impact side is really important. You know, some scientists do a press release for their preprint um, but then when it's published, they want another big press conference and it's too late. So and they've got something there about, you know, the safety of antidepressants or whether statins work. And it's kind of dribbled out in this funny way when it wasn't at its best. So I think it's still a very, very open discussion um, and, a, and a fascinating one. But but yeah, it could it could really enhance uh, trust in, in research if if we are clever about the way we do this. Mm. Thanks both. Uh, Lindsay, what else have we got? I think the next question uh, really complements some of the comments that you guys have had during the presentation here. Uh, should we promote trust in science or rather an understanding of science? Interesting, what we're really aiming for. Who'd like to speak to this? <laughs> 
Um, I, I guess I, I would just say, I mean, I, I think I agree with the, the sort of thrust of the question. Uh, and I wouldn't even say understanding of science as much as understanding of um, the scientific method of the scientific process and, and of understanding um, what science can and can't tell us. Um, science doesn't make policy. I mean, I, I think I'm sure sometimes uh, many of us wish that it could, but sometimes many of us are probably happy that it doesn't. Um, and there are, you know, realities and ethics and all sorts of things. And um, what was it, uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum line in, in one of the movies and maybe in Jurassic Park, they were, you know, maybe it wasn't Jeff Goldblum, I apologize if it wasn't, but scientists were sort of too busy figuring out if they could and, and not thinking too much about whether they should, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, there, there's sort of that sort of thing. But in terms of the question, the scientific method, uh, and again, understanding that the fact that something is published uh, to this discussion about preprints, uh, which I thought was fascinating, you know, whether or not it's peer reviewed or not, isn't actually its own, let's not make that into its own false binary because there's peer review and then there's peer review. Um, and so, and it could be overturned anyway, not because someone committed misconduct or fraud, but uh, because we learn more. So I, I, I would agree. I think that it's sort of trust in the fact that there's a, a process by which we get closer and closer to the truth that, that we ferret out more and more facts and, and, and gain knowledge rather than you should trust this because it was published somewhere and then it appeared in a textbook. And oh, by the way, it's wrong. That's a great way to, to actually create mistrust. Right. And that emphasis on the scientific process, I guess you could say that if people understand, we hope that if people understand more about the scientific process that will naturally lead to a trust in science because or at least in the scientific process because people will see the value of that so I think that's a really interesting perspective on how, how those two things are linked. Um, just because I know we want to get to as many questions as we can in the limited time we have available uh, let's move on to our next one Lindsay. I particularly love this one actually. Uh, what are some ways to reduce the stigma around retracting a publication? Hmm. I'll take this maybe to provide some evidence, right? So there is a lot of stigma. About two thirds of retractions are due to misconduct or something that we can sort of loosely call misconduct. So maybe the stigma is even well earned. But I do want to provide some data that may hopefully be reassuring, which is that it turns out that when you retract a paper for misconduct, and then the retraction notice says that, you see a sort of dip in your citations, which economists sort of use as a proxy for your reputation and for all sorts of things and can have an impact on your career. If you retract a paper for honest error or something that sounds like honest error and you sort of explain that in the notice, you actually don't see a dip in your citation. So what that says to me anyway is that if we were to, if we're honest about why something has been retracted, you actually don't have a stigma attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, the bigger question is not so much the stigma around retraction, but the fact that so much in science and research is publish or perish. And so when you, when you sort of, you know, sort of say something might be wrong with a finding or a paper, you're not just saying there's something wrong with a finding or a paper, you're sort of implying, or maybe even saying, given the incentive structure, that there's something wrong with that scientist. And that we need to get away from. But that isn't about whether or not how retractions are handled. That's about how universities, funding agencies, governments think about incentives and you know, what we really want to promote in science. And that really is a whole separate discussion. Um, just before we get to our last question, I just wonder, Renee, as someone who is so involved in composing these retraction notices that, mm -hmm. that journals post when they do retract a paper, is there anything you'd like to say about what, what your thinking is on, on composing those notices? Yeah, I think it's, well, I think it's important to really stick to the um, objective issues that are underlying that retraction decision and avoid the language that would contribute to that personal interpretation that Ivan was just talking about. You know, we're not saying we're retracting this article because that's a bad scientist or saying we're retracting this article because it's unreliable for these reasons. Um, and so I think the, the language and the focus of those notices um, is, is really important. Um, and I think another, just to add on and add on to what um, Ivan was saying. I think another piece is if somebody looks at a CV, sees a retraction and makes a judgment call about that person, that that's gonna continue to contribute to that stigma um, mm -hmm. in terms of how it's felt by the 
person whose work is attractive, but also the other people in the room um, in that discussion. That's a great point, thank you. Um, Lindsay, give us our final question, please. Absolutely, this one came in through the webinar registration form a number of days ago. Um, I think it's a great note to end on. What can scientists do to become more approachable and make scientific research more accessible for the public at large? And if I could ask our panelists to be as succinct as possible, given time limitations, please. Who'd like to speak on that? They should join the Science Media Centre database. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, oh. I, think that, I think the pandemic just shows that they really, they are approachable. I mean, that there were scientists on every single news programme, every hour of every day and there's a lot of news in the UK and I didn't get any of that old narrative about them being unapproachable and they can't speak English and no one can understand them and they're incapable of making their science accessible and understood by the public none of that was said because it wasn't true they were absolutely brilliant at talking to the public and I think the um, public trust and regard for UK scientists during the pandemic just shot up. Um, it was high mm. already compared to politicians where it went down, you know, where politicians mm. were. Um, so, so yeah, I think they're kind of, they are doing it and we should applaud them for doing it and support them for doing it. So you'd say, just get out there, give it a go, do some science just communication. Get out there, give it a go. Not everyone has to do it. If you absolutely hate it, don't. But, um, but you know, we all on this panel speak to scientists all day, every day, and they're great. And they, they bring something to the party that other people don't. Um, and I think right now in a polarized society where everybody's an armchair epidemiologist and everyone's shouting at each other, I think that scientists bring something to this in, in their, the scientific method that Ivan mentioned. And the more we hear from them, the better. Mm. That's such a such a lovely point. I think maybe if that's all right with the rest of you, we should end there. Um, that's fantastic. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. It's been such an interesting discussion, hasn't it? I've loved bringing the, the three of you together. I know you work in such different ways, but you're working towards these common goals. And it's been fantastic to hear your perspectives on all of this. I wish we could get to all the questions. I hope uh, then I'm sure we will continue to talk about these issues in the future. Um, but for now, thanks to our panelists. Thank you so much for attending as well to our audience. We really appreciated your questions, really loved having you with us and hope to speak to you more about this in future. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thanks to Plus. Yeah.